Hello everyone, welcome to the 180 Literary and Jury Charge. We're going to start off with an article on property. Okay, ready? Property is the right and interest which one has in anything that is subject to ownership. Property may be tangible or intangible, visible or invisible, movable or immovable. Any person possessing property normally has the right to possess, use, enjoy, and dispose of it. A right to property is not always exclusive, but may be held by more than one person. Property is classified in terms of the nature of the property, interest as real or personal. Real property is normally land and all things affixed to it. Generally, real property is tangible, immovable, and visible. Real property may include land, houses, trees, and buildings. Personal property is generally defined as movables. Personal property is sometimes defined as all things that are not classified as real property. Personal property may include the following items, clothing, automobiles, jewelry, furniture, and appliances. Intangible property includes goodwill, aesthetic value, and in some cases, work of art and music. In most sub instances, intangible value is subjective value. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to read you an article called Never Turn Your Back. Don't Fool with Mother Nature. A Moment's Carelessness Can Cost Your Life. Okay, ready? Americans have always had an ambivalent attitude toward the out of doors. The earliest settlers viewed the wilderness as a kind of savage beast that had to be beaten back and subdued. Today we lap up reports of bear attacks, snake bites, violent weather, and natural disasters. We still fear the forces of nature. I think that much of our fear is misplaced. As a sportsman for 30 plus years and a survivor of some very close scrapes, it is not the wild world I fear, but rather my own temerity. One of my first lessons in humility occurred on the Delaware River when I was just a teenager. My companions and I were fishing on a sunny May day from an aluminum canoe on a deceptively smooth drift that brought us close to an inviting tree-lined bank. We all grabbed our rods and concentrated on the fish rather than on where the canoe was going. Suddenly, a tree limb appeared at chest level. Instinctively, foolishly, the three of us grabbed for it. The current swept the canoe out from under us, leaving us clinging to the limb, neck deep in icy water. I can still remember how frighteningly powerful the water was, how it tugged and tore at us, trying to break our hold on that tree. We made it to the shore, hand over handing the length of the limb. When we found the canoe, it was wrapped around a rock. We needed a block and tackle to pry it free of the river's strong grip. Although I have since made it a practice always to have someone on the oars or a paddle when floating any river in any kind of boat, lapses in judgment that turn into big trouble can make many other forms or can take many other forms. I once was surf casting on Mexico's west coast. The surf was up. It was an angry water, just fine, breaking waves that had lured a school of Corvina close to shore, to feed on the mullet in the wave wash. I was getting nearly a strike per cast and had just lost a big yellow fin Corvina that broke off, taking my lure. I was excited to waste time wading back to shore to tie on a new lure. Instead, I simply turned my back to the surf, clamped my rod butt between my knees, and knotted a new lure to my line right there. The wave that hit me was bigger than any I had seen that afternoon. It slammed me into the sand and rolled me like a rag doll toward the beach. Then it began to drag me seaward as my waders ballooned in the undertow. While the huge wave retreated from the beach, it sucked enough water back to sea so that I could find my footing and stand in thigh deep water. The weight of the water in my waders anchored my feet to the sand. Once the strong undertow subsided, I managed to waddle back up onto the beach. 
Another failure to recognize potential disaster almost cost me my wife. We were hunting for broadbills in the Great South Bay off Long Island, New York, a form of water fouling where you shoot over decoys from a low-profile boat, a scooter anchored well offshore. The best hunting place takes place during bitter cold weather when the bay's ice is up. Pockets of ice-free water open in the mantle of ice and broadbills are drawn to them like chickens to cracked corn. Because it is such a cold sport, it is customary for one person to man the scooter while the other keeps warm in a nearby car. i just done my turn in the rig, and as we changed places in the tender, I told Jen that I would run to town for some hot soup and coffee. It was a sunny, calm day with temperatures in the low 20s. Every sign pointed toward stable ice, but when I returned ten minutes later, my knees buckled. Inexplicably, the ice had broken loose from the shore and was drifted toward Fire Island, some four miles away. The scooter, decoys, and gin were caught up in its leading edge. Although the scooter was equipped with oars, Jen found that rowing into the ice sheet was impossible. She tried to break ice in front of the bow, then paddle a few feet forward, but the oncoming ice would meet the boat before it made any headway. I jumped into the tender and held my breath. I had no idea if the five-horse outboard had enough power to break a path to the scooter or enough reserve to get us both back to shore. The motor raced, kicking up a rooster tail of spray, the boat inched forward, the soft salt ice buckling under it. I got a line to the scooter, bid farewell to the decoys, and kissed both the sand and Jen when we got ashore. People don't deliberately set out to freeze or drown or slide off steep trails, but such things happen all the time. Every autumn, there are stories of sportsmen who leave home unprepared for sudden changes in the weather and fall victim to exposure. Every spring and summer, easily avoidable boating accidents claim lives, and fishermen are swept away by a combination of currents and slippery rocks, and a moment's carelessness. Does this mean we should fear the outdoors? Of course not, but it does mean we should never fail to respect it. If we always keep in mind the human capacity to get into trouble by failing to think ahead, we'll never, through arrogance or ignorance, Turn our backs on nature's awesome potential. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to give you a paragraph on legal, and you're going to hear custody, K-U-D, photograph, F long O F, FOF, fingerprint, initial F, final P, misdemeanor, I write that M-I-F-D. Okay, here we go. Crimes may be classified as felonies or misdemeanors. A felony is a crime which may be punishable by death or imprisonment. Misdemeanors include all other crimes and are punishable by a short jail sentence and the imposition of a fine. A principal is considered an active perpetrator of the crime. An accessory is a person who aids, abets, solicits, or facilitates the crime. When a person is charged with the actual commission of a crime, a warrant may be issued according to the or ordering the arrest of the individual. Once arrested, the accused is taken into custody and fingerprinted, photographed, and interrogated. All right, here's an article on budgets. Ready? A budget is a statement of monetary objectives for a specified period of time. Every business, household, and government agency finds planning easier when a budget is prepared. An annual budget should be broken down into months or quarters to readily allow for forecasting and planning. The budget is a tool for controlling expenditures and assessing management performance. A well-planned budget will allow for small changes in economic factors and will have built-in alternatives in the case of emergency expenditures. Most businesses and government agencies operate within the constraints of a budget. Budgeting promotes planning on the part of management and allows performance comparisons. 
a budget is an important planning tool for every business and household as well. All right. This is my next article is on technical terminology. Okay, here we go. Ready? Okay, here we go. Any language that you do not know can be termed foreign or technical. In other words, it is more difficult to write because you do not comprehend it instantly. Generally speaking, however, when we speak of technical terminology, we refer to medical, legal, chemical, or other language of the professions. A mathematician, for, ex for instance, can speak about the properties of mathematics. A nuclear physicist can speak for days about his specialty in the language that can make it very difficult to report. The reporter does not have to be a doctor in order to write what the doctor says, or a lawyer to report what the lawyer says, and so on. The reporter must, however, become familiar with enough of the language of these and other professions so that the words can be reported with a minimum of difficulty and hesitation. Shorthand speed drops rapidly when you have to ponder what was said before writing it. But the first thing to do is to learn as much about English vocabulary as you possibly can. Take English courses. If you feel that you would like to further improve your knowledge along these lines, try to enroll at a local college or university to learn more about the important subjects such as legal and medical terminology. Read books on anatomy, physiology, chemistry, engineering, law. Some of the textbooks used by nurses, nurses training schools are good references for the student reporter. The National Shorthand Reporters Association publishes a professional series of texts, including volumes of English, medical, and legal terminology. They are excellent sources of material for students. When you know that you will have to report a highly technical case or deposition, read as much as you can about that specialty in advance. You will have fewer surprises during the course of the case or deposition. Many hearings are being held concerning environment and ecology. These fields offer their own set of technical terms. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency publish, publishes a glossary of common environmental terms and can be had for the asking. It includes terms and definitions of, the, of most of the words and phrases that you might be expected to write when reporting an environmental protection hearing. Not everything you report will involve a so-called expert witness whose language will make your work harder. To be safe, however, you must assume that your future as a court reporter will be peopled with enough expert witnesses from the various sciences and professions that you should begin now to increase your knowledge about as many disciplines as you can. Okay. Got an article here on the Amish Odyssey. One man's journey into the heart of an extraordinary people. Okay. All right, here we go. Ten years ago, while exploring the farmlands of his home state of Pennsylvania, photographer Bill Coleman stumbled upon a remote little valley touched by time, or touched little by time. No telephone poles or electric lines. Not a foot of wasted ground, he said, just cleanliness and order, a harmony between the people and the land. Most of the 700 residents of this self-contained and exquisitely man manicured valley are Old Order Amish. So let me say that again, Old Order Amish, descendants of the strict religious sect that emigrated from Switzerland to America in the 18th century. The Amish avoid most strangers. Although they greeted Coleman with suspicion at first, they gradually came to tolerate him for who he is, a photographer trying to document their daily lives without exploiting them. As he grew to know and cherish these people, he forged a special relationship with them. I have not become a scholar of the Amish or read many books on the subject, Coleman says. 
I would rather find out about them through small surprises, little cameos here and there. Many of these surprises involve children. You never know what Amish children are going to do, says Coleman. They have a lot they have a love of affair with day to day living. During the summer teenagers attend a Sunday evening sing. You can hear the murmur of folk songs from half a mile away. At other times Coleman is struck by the silence that pervades Amish life. I got to know an Amish school teacher, he recalls. One day during recess, I said to her, I never hear these children raise their voices, even during games. Why not? She said, well, did you ever hear an Amish adult raise his voice? For Coleman, taking these photographs has become a life's work. Each day I venture into the valley, he says. I expect to be humbled by seeing something I've never previously noticed. When I do, it's sudden joy, but at the same time I feel, why didn't you see it before? It was here, you know. With an unobstructive and loving, even envious lens, Coleman has created more than just photographs. His soft, luminous images can be read as a diary of one man's journey into the very heart of an extraordinary people. I, too, always feel so fascinated with them. Okay. I'm going to give you some legal opinion and argument. Here we go. Ready? Furthermore, there is also an allegation, a claim with respect to interference between a contractual relationship between Gibson and Huntington Center which was carried out for anti-competitive considerations. Coast's actions, as they undertook in this case, interfered with that relationship. Huntington Center had made arrangements and entered into a relationship with Gibson after they were told by Coast that Coast would not pay any rent. They were moving out of the center. They were going to leave it behind. That is when they got into the consideration with Gibson. When Coast learned about that, this is when they undertook to really move to put Leo's in there. We believe that the anti-competitor unfair competition and that interference with the contractual relationship is of great moment in this lawsuit. And we think they deserve to be raised if Coast is going to be permitted to raise its equitable defenses as to estoppel and waiver. With respect to one question here, which was 56, I believe, Your Honor, it is apparent that the line was drawn in the wrong place to me. And on page 28A, it is my error, and apparently I'm going to have to withdraw the motion with respect to question 56, because it was intended that page 28A should have been addressed to lines 10 through 12, that is, to include Mr. Cutcliffe. We believe the knowledge of those particular officers of coast is of great relevance in determining this anti-competitive issue. I also raised with your clerk the fact that prior to the assignment of the unlawful detainer case to your honor for all purposes, and that is the case of Huntington Center versus Coastal Federal, case 26-03-24, we filed a motion to compel answers to interrogatories. I don't have that document with me today, but it was either notice for Department 25 or 28 in accordance. Okay. I've got some jury duty here. Here we go. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. You're here for a very important purpose. You're here for jury service. This is one of the things that you can actually do to display your patriotism. You can serve in the military, but that's a big one. But the other stuff like waving the flag on the 4th of July, pasting the American flag on the back of your pickup truck, I'm not putting stock in those things. I'm more about doing. This is the doing. When you vote, you can mail that one in. This one, we need you in person. The whole system of justice is found on getting 12 strangers here to listen to some facts regardless of where the chips may fall. And that is one of the things that makes everybody want to be here 
as opposed to somewhere else. It only happens when we do all of our duties. This is the case number RIF132260. And my clerk is going to administer the oath. When we ask you questions, you have to answer them truthfully, okay? In just one second, she's very busy. Everybody, please stand up and raise your right hand. Thank you. You may be seated. This is serious business. The prosecution, the defense, the court, we all take this very seriously, and we're planning on you being honest. The jury oath is the foundation of the system, okay? You've been summoned as a juror in a criminal case, and this is a very serious case. There are three defendants. It is a death penalty case. Okay, and that concludes our jury charge and literary for the 180 class. Have a great day.